verse 11. After I read the King James Version, what version is this actually? King James. After I read the King James Version of Philippians 4 verse 11, I will also read what is called the Weymouth Translation of Philippians 4 verse 11. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. But before we do that, you know what comes next. If you have your Bibles, please lift it and repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. Today as I hear his word, it takes root in my heart and it bears a hundredfold fruit in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Daniel chapter 6 verse 10 here begins the reading of god's word now when daniel knew that the writing was signed he went into his house and his windows being open in his chamber towards jerusalem he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his god as he did before time brief context there was an edict that nobody should pray to any other God. And the Bible says even though Daniel had heard the edict and even though Daniel was prime minister and was responsible for ensuring everybody else obeyed the edict, the Bible says even after he heard it, as we can read, he goes into his home and we see that he doesn't go to pray in order to prove a point. No, the Bible says this was what he always did. And now there was a reason for him to no longer do it. Uh, but the Bible records that he remained consistent in his custom. And what was his custom? That at certain times, three times a day, he will go to his room, open the windows towards Jerusalem, and he will pray. And so we're dealing with a man who offered no excuses uh, who could not and refused to allow the circumstances to dictate his behavior. That was Daniel chapter 6 verse 10. Now go with me to Philippians chapter 4 verse 11. King James says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be content. I have learned in whatever state I am, therewith to be content. The Weymouth translation, I think, gives us slightly a bit more clarity when it says, I have learned, and this is what I need you to take home with you, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therein to be independent of circumstances. Sure, that's a biting one. I have learned in whatsoever state I am in therein uh, to be independent of circumstances. This morning, I want to bring you into part two of raising the bar. And we are going to emphasize the concept of personal accountability. Personal accountability. Bow your hearts as I pray. Teacher, teach us, educate, instruct, enlighten. Let your light shine deep. Cause my tongue to be as the pen of the ready writer. Uh, cause the hearts of your children to embrace, receive, and action your counsel. Today, our lives change like never before. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Hmm. I want to remind us of one or two things that we mentioned last week. Last week, we talked about the necessity for personal responsibility. Please listen to me. For short, I might be calling it PR, but please listen. The concept of personal responsibility is such that without it, in any area of your life where you lack PR, in that area, you will suffer failure. Listen to me. In any area where you lack a full complement of personal responsibility, in that area, you will suffer stagnation, you will suffer limitation. And this has nothing to do with whether you love Jesus or not. 
This was why last week, one of the things I kept on saying was that even if you are a prayer warrior, you fast a uh, hundred days in the year, if you do not learn how to have personal responsibility, all your praying will be in vain. What is personal responsibility? There is a strong connection between personal responsibility and what we will deal with this morning, personal accountability. There is a strong connection such that, and I'll explain subsequently, you can't have personal accountability without personal responsibility, but it is possible to have personal responsibility without personal accountability. Let me clarify. What is personal responsibility? Personal responsibility is when you accept two things. One, you are quick to accept your role in a situation. And then number two, you also accept that you have the power to change it. Let me say it again. What is personal responsibility? Personal responsibility is when you accept your role in a situation, but it also means you understand and you accept the fact that you have the power to change it. This was why one of the key scriptures we used last week was, is it Philippians 4.19? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, this will help you. Let me push through with this. People who have learned to take full personal responsibility notice that they also exhibit full power to change their circumstances and alter their experiences. Let me say it again. I have observed, and, and people more intelligent than I am have observed the same, that people who have learned to take full personal responsibility for what they have and where they are and what they're experiencing, they're experiencing people who have learned to take full personal responsibility, they also notice that they also have great power to change their circumstances and alter their experiences. Listen. Full personal responsibility does not mean you absolve others of their role in the matter, which is what some people have, have thought I was saying. I'm not saying. Uh, for example, I gave the illustration last week of a single mother who focuses on the fact that the father of the children is no longer um, supporting the family. And uh, some have thought that I was blaming the single mother for not pushing forward to get the resource from the, from the father. No, that's not what I'm saying. You should exhaust everything possible to get what is due you and get what is due your children. But this is where the problem starts. When that single mother begins to inculcate in her thinking that the reason why she doesn't have enough is because somebody is not helping her. The reason why she can never have enough and she will never be enough and have enough for her children is because this man is not coming to the party. At that point, she no longer is taking personal responsibility for her situation. Child of God, understand this. Even if that father does not show up ever again, a child of God must always remember that God never leaves us stranded. Settle it in your heart. That, and, and one of the things that will happen in your space, when you take personal responsibility for where you are, whether you have money or you don't, whether you have a great relationship or you don't. And when I say great relationship, I'm talking marital relationship, relationship with your parents, whether you have a great relationship or not, whether your children that you have responsibility over are doing well or not. When you come to the place where you take personal responsibility for it, you will suddenly realize that you also are surrounded with the power to change the situation. Do you know that that thinking that somebody else is responsible for where I am, responsible for what I have, also responsible for where I will be is foolishness. And you are ceding your power to somebody else. Are you listening to me? This is why 
we emphasized last week the necessity for us to build a strong sense of personal responsibility. I want you to repeat after me. All power is mine. I'm not making it up. The Bible tells us that. The Bible tells us that Jesus was speaking and Jesus said that all power in heaven and on earth has been given unto him. And then he further explains to us that we are baptized into him. If we are baptized into him and all power is his, then all power is mine. So let's say it again. All power is mine. So there is a need for us to have a strong sense of personal responsibility. I want to say this. When a parent says, and I'm using this as, a, as an example because it is something that I have had to battle with with a number of parents, including myself. I'm not absorbing myself. Including myself. How many of you have found yourself here before? When a parent says, that child knows how to push my buttons. How many of you have had children or have children who you are convinced that they are an assignment? <laughs> Maybe you don't want to admit it. <laughs> uh, but listen, when a parent says that that child knows how to push their buttons and leaves it there, listen to the problem with that. They enforce the weakness within themselves. Watch this. They actually are enforcing weakness, the weakness within themselves, and ultimately they perpetuate the behavior of both them and the child, thereby compounding the problem. Listen, when you blame a child for pushing your buttons instead of asking why you have those buttons, you, you don't get it. Instead of asking why you have not removed the wiring that causes you to detonate, you have, you have ceded the ability to control yourself to a child. Hmm. So, you have put yourself in a position where you are a slave to your emotions and since that child knows how to stir up that emotion, you are being led by a five-year-old. So that child has power over you. You have what that means and, and, and one of the ways you know as a parent that you are lacking in a lot of this. Sure, today is going to be good. <laughs> One of the ways that you know as a parent that you are lacking in a lot of this is if in order to get your child to do stuff, you repeatedly have to use phrases like, because I say so. Use phrases like, um, I am your father and I said so, go and do it. Or continuously have to raise your voice. If you have to raise your voice consistently, to get your child to get the job done, one, if you have to throw your title in order to get the child to get the job done, guess what? You are operating in a low sense of personal responsibility. You and I know that leaders that have to use their titles to get their staff to get things done are operating in the lowest level of leadership. John Maxwell calls it positional leadership. And we find that even as parents. A hey, spouses, the same thing. Husbands, if you have to, to throw scripture <laughs> to get your wife to do the things you feel she ought to do, you are operating with a low sense of personal responsibility. You are also operating at the at positional leadership the lowest level of if you have to say because I'm your husband the Bible says <laughs> wives submit <laughs> it's amazing how many men that's the only scripture they know <laughs> that even, even, even your God says wives submit if you have to resort to threats 
whether they are spiritual or otherwise, to get the job done, you are operating with low personal responsibility. I, won't, I can't go into it as well, but it also means you are operating at a low emotional intelligence. Because it means your options of expressions are very limited. Very limited. Hmm. <laughs> Those who never blame others but see that they have the power simultaneously but see that they have the power, simultaneously increase their capacity to use that power. They make decisions quickly and God willing, not emotionally. I need to do this. I'm going there again. Mm. You know that place that will make you go, ah, ah, Pastor Tim now. Yeah. Some people think that it's because some people have money some people are more beautiful. Some people have more connections. And that's why uh, the boss likes them. That's why the pastor prefers them. That's why they're getting more opportunities. It might be so, but a lot of times it is not. Listen to me. It is not. That thinking that that is the only reason why they're being preferred is another sign of a low sense of personal responsibility. Let me explain what I mean. Do you know that even the Bible puts it like this? The Bible says, who, Matthew 13, verse 12, it says, For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he will have more in abundance. But whosoever does not have, from him will be taken even that which he thinks he has. Do you know what this, how does this sound fair? It says that the one that has will be given more. And then the one that does not have, even what he thinks he has will be taken. That doesn't feel like, like God is being fair. But why is that the case? The reason why is because when the Bible says to him that hath, the reason why the person has is because of the way they are thinking. And the scripture is saying if they continue thinking like that, they will have more. Do you understand? The reason why they got this far in the first place, there is a way, there is a mindset that they have cultivated that has brought them to this place of elevation. And the scripture is saying, if they continue with it, nothing will stop them from having more. Then he goes to the one that does not have. The one that is feeling like they are being overlooked. And he says, even that, that thinking that they don't have is the reason why they don't have. And as long as they continue with that thinking, even what they actually have, they will lose. Meaning, that thinking will continually erode their space. Hmm. So that thinking... That this person's marriage, you know, somebody told me that, that the reason why your marriage is great is because you married a good woman. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I'm not downplaying how good she is. But do not for a moment discount my efforts. Yeah. Uh, are you high? If you were to ask my wife now, she will give you a litany of things that I do to ensure that this good woman remains good. <laughs> and I'm not bragging. I can say it like this because I consciously do it. Are you listening to me? I discovered that if this thing was going to be beautiful, it will be because I make it beautiful. And I've tried to help us see the same. Not it will be beautiful, beautiful because we make it beautiful. <laughs> it will be beautiful because I make it beautiful. You say, no, but it takes two to tango. Calm down. 
if you pick one end of the stick, you have affected the other end of the stick. How many of you are listening to me? Even if that end does not want to be picked up, if I pick up one end of the stick, I will affect the other end. Everybody has a trigger. How else will I explain it? Everybody can be cultivated. Everybody can be inspired. Everybody has a button. That's why you can blame your child for pushing yours. Everybody does. Everybody does. So that thinking that the marriage is better because they married a better wife. That thinking that this person has, oh, this one I was counseling somebody this past week. This person has more. This person is doing so much better in their relationships because they grew up in a stable home. And this is the argument. I, I watched a pastor do this, and my heart was grieved. The pastor came on air, and, and he's a very popular pastor, and he was talking about how he married a very good wife, you know, and the wife is, is beginning to understand that the reason why, listen to this, the reason why he is the way he is is because he's trying to be a leader in the home where he was never given an example or a model to follow after. How many of you understand that that is a real problem? But when you sit and do what I do, I could see what this man was trying to do. Let me tell you what this man was trying to do. He was trying to program the wife to accept his foolishness. Say it often enough, she, she begins to feel a sense of... She begins to feel guilty for calling him out on his foolishness. And when I heard him say this, this was years ago, I pointed at him and said, you are either about to cheat or you will cheat soon. I wasn't cursing him. Two years ago, it hit the news. He had cheated on his wife. Of course he would. Why? Because that posture that he was putting, how do you, how do you say, see, when you are 16, blame those ahead of you. Blame them. Blame them hard. When you are 20, blame them. You are 21, you are 22, you are 25, you are 30. You are blaming your father for where you are in life. You will remain there. That is a sense. You have a low personal sense of personal responsibility. Are you listening to me? I've accepted the fact that I struggle with relationships. I struggle. It's not coincidence that I married early. I don't know how to do. I struggle with relationships. And so I find a relationship, I go there, I commit, and that's it. I commit. The rest I cordon off. I, I commit. And I said to God that it's a problem because I'm a pastor. <laughs> My wife has said this to me before. You are the most unwilling pastor I know. <laughs> But it's also one of the reasons why I married my wife. Because where I am weak, she's strong. But I have not allowed this weakness to become an excuse for not rising to do what I need to do. What, is, what stories are you telling yourself to justify your inaction? To justify not making peace with that parent, to justify not taking the next step to pioneer. What excuse are you giving yourself? The excuse might be justified, but it is still what it is. It's an excuse. And it's revealing that you have a low sense of personal responsibility, meaning you have not accepted the fact that you have the power to make the change. Let me push. Hmm. Let me move now 
to the concept of personal accountability. Pay attention to this. This is, this is quite interesting. Um, let me just throw this out there. We're trying to get a proper headset or lapel mic, but we are struggling. Um, some of the ones that we have seen do not serve the purpose that we need. So if you are in that field, that industry, and you can give us recommendations, please do so. This holding a microphone is one of the reasons why this job is hard. <laughs> Let's talk about personal accountability. What is personal accountability? Now, if we have defined personal responsibility as you accepting the fact that you have the power to change your circumstance, we define then, in this case, personal accountability as having the discipline to follow through. Stay with me. This is going to get very interesting. Having the discipline to follow through, meaning I realize I, the power to make changes within me and around me is in my hands, and I am willing to rise and use that power and be consistent in the utilization of that power till I see the outcome I desire. That is personal accountability. When we talk about personal accountability, like I mentioned with regards to personal um, responsibility, personal accountability is also like a pendulum. It is like a pendulum. I want you to see this. Let me draw a pendulum here. So you have those on this extreme, and unlike um, when I explain personal responsibility, this pendulum speaks about how a person grows into it. So not two different sides of it. All right, but how a person grows. So on this end is the obvious. This is an individual who needs all the motivation, all the supervision, all the inspiration, all the oversight on the planet to get them to do the job. Then on this side, you have the individual who, once the job has been clearly indicated, they run. You don't need to ask any questions. You don't need any oversight. When the job is done, they report. How many of you get what I'm saying? So th on this side, you are dealing with individuals that do not need any form of supervision. They just need enough clarity, and the job will be done. As at when due. No postponements, no excuses. Job will be done as at when due. Now, this brings us to this and as I begin to show you this I want you to take a moment to see where you fall into watch this matrix on the x axis on the y axis we have personal responsibility on the x-axis, we have personal accountability. This box up here represents an individual with high personal responsibility but low personal accountability. Do you agree? This box represents an individual with low personal responsibility, and what? Low personal accountability. This box represents somebody with low personal responsibility, and what? High personal accountability. And this one, obviously, high PR and high PA. Let's try and describe the various characters in these boxes. Box number one, an individual, how do you spot an individual who is high in personal responsibility but low in personal accountability? Somebody actually asked me, are there people like that? Oh, yes, many. 
what does it mean to have high PR but low PA? A person with high, a high sense of personal responsibility, they know that they have the power to make changes, but they lack the habit to do it. They lack the discipline to follow through. People that find themselves here usually experience a lot of depression. There is a lot of self-deprecation, you know, not seeing themselves in a good light. The reason is because it is a painful thing to know what you have to do, but I have to come to terms with the fact that, but why am I not doing it? And then you start doing it, and then you stop doing it. Like the gym you are not longer going to. That you started going to at the beginning of the year. You're not there anymore. And you're saying, I need to cancel this membership. Cancel it, cancel it. Don't deceive yourself. Just cancel it. You're not ready for it. In that area of your life, there is high personal responsibility. You know it has to be done. You are fully persuaded of the benefits if you will do it. But you lack the discipline to follow through. Does this make sense? You know there are people like this. See, you can be this, high PR and high PA, in one area of your life, and then low PR and low PA in another area of your life. So do not limit this matrix, all right? Just find yourself. Number two, let's look at people that are low in personal responsibility, but they are high in personal accountability. People that are low here, this box, but they are high here. These kind of individuals usually display a lot of pride. Oh, stay with me. This will help you. They display a great sense of pride. People with this profile, because it is a profile, people with this profile in that area are often what we call narcissistic. They are often narcissistic. They can be disciplined, but refuse to take responsibility for their actions. Listen to me. This will help you. They often like the desire, they also often lack the desire to seek help because they can't see that they need help. After all, it's not their fault. So you can have individuals here that are very successful, meaning, remember I explained to you last week that personal responsibility is a two double-sided coin. On one side is a person who acknowledges, acknowledges the fact that they are responsible for how things are. There is a role that they have played. There is a role that they are playing to sustain it. They accept that. And then on the flip side of the coin, they also accept the fact and know the fact that they have the power to change it. All right? So a person here could have accepted the fact that they have the power to make changes, but they have eroded the other side of the coin. They never accept responsibility for their faults. So a person in the workplace, for example, you can find an individual like this who can be very successful because they are disciplined enough to take action, consistent enough to sustain that action, to produce results. But if, they, if something goes wrong, they will always find a fall guy. It can't be them. How can it be them? They're narcissistic. Individuals here... It is always about the outcome that they desire. And when it is the outcome they desire, their high PA will kick in. They will give it everything. When it is not, they will blame you for their lack of interest. Is someone listening to me? I see this in marriages. Actually, I see all of them. In marriages, I see this as parents. I see this as, as entrepreneurs. I see this as people pushing a career. How many of you are with me so far? Are you feeling sleepy? Should we 
do my head, my shoulders, my knees. My, you know, that's what the teachers used to do when, when people were falling asleep. <laughs> Please don't fall asleep. If you're falling asleep, it's the devil. He doesn't want you to know this truth. <laughs> oh, God, have mercy. Let's look at the third category. People that are low in personal responsibility, but also low in personal accountability. These are, so this is this box, all right? These are individuals who live life in a daze. They often display traits of laziness. They are uninspired. They are terrible to live with. They do business, uh, terrible to live with or do business with or to have as a colleague. You see, these are the ones that blame everybody else for where they are. And even if you give them help, there is no energy to do it. None. So, these are the kind that Jesus was actually referring to when he spoke about not casting your pearls before swines. Because it is futile. It is futile. In that area, they display a lot of laziness. High levels of procrastination is here. This is the one that David was referring to when he says, there is a lion in the streets. They are supposed to go out and do something, and their excuse for not doing it is, there is a lion in the streets. You say, what does that mean? It was a, what you call a hyperbole. What Jesus was saying there was, whatever reason they give you, it is exaggerated. It is exaggerated. They could have overcome it, but they are telling you stories. Are you listening? Ah, when you make the mistake of employing this person. The sad part about people here, or you marry this one. You see, this is why when you come to us and you want to get married, we take you through a lengthy process. This couple here will take you through a rigorous routine. When you come to me, rigorous. And the reason is because one of the things we're trying to see is where are you here as it relates to marriage, as it relates to money, as it relates to having children, where are you here? And when we find you, can we help you? And when we can't help you, we won't wed you. Did you hear me? I'm saying it now. I've done this work now for what? 26, 27 years. I've counseled couples for over 25 years. I've been married for 20 of that. So I've done this long enough to see, and this is a painful experience, long enough to see people who have violated the counsel we've given them. We've been in this game long enough to, to watch them self-destruct. To watch their marriage or their children destruct. It is a reality. This, find out, ask yourself, in this or that area of my life, is this me? Or is this me? Or is this me? The ultimate is to come to a place where in every area of your life, you have a sense, a strong sense of personal responsibility and a strong sense of personal accountability. You understand that there is a role that you play. You are where you are because of who you are. No one is holding your destiny. Did you hear me? No one is holding your destiny. Does it matter the title they occupy, spiritual or otherwise? No one is holding your destiny back. There are people that can help you push it forward, but no one is holding it back. No one is responsible for the state of your marriage. See, as much as you can say, this person is not doing X, Y, and Z. You need to ask yourself, what is my role in this? Listen to me. And this is why I need to take you couples away. For any Jezebel to succeed, there must be an Ahab. It takes both for that system to exist. Jezebel very controlling, very manipulative, and it is so easy to say that she was the bad one. Ah, stop it! Yes, I'm not absolving her 
for being manipulative, overbearing. I'm not absolving her of that. But the only reason why she could pull it off was because she was now with a man who allowed himself to be manipulated. So what if he didn't know? Then is he a man or a boy? Is he a man? If he's a man, how does he not know? Listen, if Jezebel was with Esau, how many of you know Esau in the Bible? Some of you don't know Esau. Go and read your Bible. Those that know Esau were the ones exclaiming now. Esau is a guy, if he's not happy with you, he'll kill you. He'll... Esau does not understand. You know, Esau's understanding of success is I want it, I like it, I take it. If there's an obstacle, you remove it. If the obstacle is your brother, kill him. So Jacob, his brother, had to run for their life. If Jezebel was with Esau, ah, actually it would not have happened. How many of you understand? It will not have happened. Jezebel would have realized this thing is not functional. <laughs> Esau would have realized before I go to jail, I walk away. It takes one for the other to thrive. So if Ahab was unhappy with, with Jezebel, he needed to come to a greater sense of personal responsibility to realize that he was king. He was king. She's queen, but he was king. He could have changed the story and built a better kingdom. Jezebel ultimately caused his death. I want to close with this. Listen. So the goal for all of us is to come to a place where we are high in personal responsibility and we are high in personal accountability. The key to achieving this, amongst others, is to start from examining and that's what I'm hoping you would do as you leave here and for the rest of this week you examine each area of your life and find your box as a parent which box am I in as a spouse which box am I in and child of God listen if you are a spouse when you pick your box ask your spouse if you are correct Listen to me. Those who operate with low PR and high PA in a relationship can never see themselves in this box. A third party needs to help them see. They just can't. The camera points only on them. Only on their good side. They can't see any other. So if you are married, you need a third party to help you know that you have picked the right box. Ask yourself, when it comes to my business, the way I operate as an entrepreneur, which box am I in? This is why the scripture that we read, Philippians 4.11, did you see what Paul said? Look at this. This is such a beautiful scripture. Paul said, Paul said, not that I speak in respect. No, I have learned in whatsoever state I am in, therein to be independent of circumstances. Paul is saying, I am independent of third parties. I am independent of circumstances. Meaning, it doesn't matter good day, bad day, that which I'm supposed to do, I do. I, I read this meme and it made me laugh, but it was an important message. So a, a, a man watched a husband and wife have an argument. And the argument was, the, the woman was cooking and they were arguing about something. And the argument was now escalating, you know? And, and, and their voices were beginning to rise above normal conversational threshold. And he was watching. And, and while they were having this argument, the wife finished cooking, dish the food and put it on the table and turned to the man and said, it's ready -o. And the man got up to sit down to eat. He said he had to ask him, ah, you people are fighting. You are going to, she still cooks for you and you are going to eat it. And his response was, when it is oxtail, who turns their back on oxtail? <laughs> who turns... <laughs> But 
But an important lesson. Both of them have understood that the disagreement here does not, does not absolve me of my responsibility. My duty is my duty. I am committed to my duty. I am independent of circumstances. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm independent of circumstances. Without building this concept in us. See, without this concept, for example, you will struggle to start a business and push it to a place of success. Because there will be days in that business where it will feel like you are pushing a boulder up a hill. Pushing a boulder up a mountain. And the annoying thing about that, the terrible thing about that is that you will have people who will come alongside you as you are pushing the boulder up the mountain and they will say to you, and justifiably so, this boulder is too big. This, um, you're pushing up a mountain. Maybe you need to push it down the mountain instead. You will have people that will come and give you justifiable reasons why you should stop pushing that boulder. And guess what? When you have a low sense of personal accountability, their counsel will make sense. How many of you hear me? Their counsel will make sense. When you have a great sense of a high level of personal accountability, you listen to counsel, but you are governed by your values. Did you hear me? You are governed by your values. Your values keep you. I want to share with you something very, very personal. So, some years ago, I realized that there was a lady in my personal space that I had, no, I guess that, that is not true, that I was suspicious that if I did not take care, this lady, I would get attracted to her. And do you know, I have no issues with my wife. We have a phenomenal relationship. It is amazing how a man can be happy in their marriage and yet still have roving eyes. This is why when somebody asked me, what makes men cheat? And we're given a list. I said, because they choose to. Because whatever list you are given, it can be overcome. Are you listening? What makes a woman cheat? Because she chooses to. Oh, and by the way, women cheat too. Calm down. Calm down. Let's not create a fight in the house of God. <laughs> this is not about who cheats more. <laughs> the issue is, it is a reality that we must accept. Okay? <laughs> Whenever I find anyone in my solar system that could do that to me, I tell my wife about the person. And I'm able to do that because my wife and I, over the years, we have grown, and she... See, there are some men that dare not do that, oh! Go and tell your wife, there's this lady that I might be liking. The lady has not done anything, you've not done anything, your house will catch fire. They will... <laughs> So I explained to her, I said, oh, there's this lady in my, in, in my world now that, look, if you ever see me getting close, be very concerned, be very concerned, all right, and make sure we address it. And so we had that conversation. And then I told my other two friends, because she was in my solar system, I had to do work with this person. And so I told my other two friends that serve as my, my oversight, um, my accountability partners. So I, I shared it with them. I told them, this is the lady. If you ever hear me, no matter, even if I tell you she was, she was dying. And I'm the only one who can save her. Make sure you go with me. 
No. And we have that understanding with each other. So one day, I had taken a break. I had, I had taken time away from home so that I could finish some work that I was doing. And I was with a young man. You, some of you know him. His name is Kuda. I was with a young man, and he was doing some work for me and helping me complete my work. And then this lady was now going to come and see me at the place that I was staying. She was going to come and see me. So we agreed on the date. She was going to finish my work, and she was going to come through. And myself, her, and Kuda were going to sit, and we're going to work. Now understand, this is no longer in a restaurant. This was in an apartment that I was staying, and I was working. And I was comfortable with it because we had to get the work done, but Kuda was going to be with me. And then an emergency happened, and Kuda had to leave. <laughs> you people are doing like, this is an episode of Skim Sam. <laughs> Yeah. Listen. See, people tell stories. You know, people talk about people talk about how they've not done this, they've not done that, particularly when it comes to relationships. And I say to them, they are telling you about the ones they did not want. I want to hear the story about the one you wanted. How did that one go? You know? So so I, I, was, I was not saying it could have, so can't you postpone it? You, but he, it was an emergency. He had to leave. In that brief moment, I had to make a decision. Everything in me said, ah, ah. Man of God. I'm a man of God. I've never cheated on my wife before. I know better than that. How will I cheat on my wife? After all, this work, there's a deadline, oh. We need to finish this thing. And could have done his part. So let her come and we'll quickly finish. I mean, we, we, we'll just sit at the table, quickly finish, and then she'll go. No, no, no issue. <laughs> and then the Lord asked me. He said, okay, so if that's the case and you're certain of that, no problem. Tell your wife that she's coming. Could has gone. She's coming. And it's just the two of you. A bed next door. It's just the two of you. Uh, but you're a man of God. Doesn't she trust you? And I realized I wasn't ready to make that phone call. <laughs> no, it's the truth. I wasn't ready to make that phone call. Because I knew what my wife was going to say. Are you, are you okay? My wife will call the lady and say, don't go. But her husband is suddenly no longer available. <laughs> if she doesn't do that, there's something wrong with her. So I pick up the phone and I call the lady. And I said, I'm sorry, the third party that will be with us is no longer available. I never, I'm never alone with a lady that is not my wife. So I'm sorry you can no longer come. She says, thank you very much. Um, we will reschedule then. I said, thank you. And we ended the conversation. Look, the fact that I did that, don't think that after I put the phone down, I was totally okay. <laughs> I have blood, though. <laughs> I have blood. Though. Put the phone down. And my mother says, hey! <laughs> See what you are me. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Pastor T, look at you. But we stood our ground. And now I can confidently say nobody can show up in my solar system and make any claim. Nobody. Since I got my, nobody. Why? Not because we haven't faced. But because we decided that when it comes to our relationship, we will attempt to build a high PR and a high PA. Someone listen to me. Grace God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. Meaning whatever it is, there is enough grace for you to pull it off. Oh, there's so much more to say. I'm out of time. Rise to your feet.